What if I told you that ashwagandha acts just like a psychiatric drug and carries many of the same risks? That's right. This safe supplement, marketed as a natural fix for stress, sleep, low testosterone, can actually cause a whole range of problems like tolerance, withdrawal, emotional blunting, and even long-term sexual dysfunction. If you knew these things, you might think twice about taking it. And so today we're gonna be breaking down the hidden dangers of this so-called safe supplement and what the wellness industry doesn't want you to know. And so firstly, let's talk a little bit about what this herb really is. Well, ashwagandha is a herb used in Ayurvedic medicine, traditionally referred to as the Indian ginseng. And it's been used for centuries to treat things like fatigue and to help people recover from illness. But in recent years, it's been rebranded for Western audiences as a quick fix solution for modern stress. In many ways, it's sold as this all-in-one sort of wellness product. It's marketed as a cure for chronic stress and burnout, anxiety and low mood, poor sleep, low T, brain fog, lack of focus, and it's commonly found in adaptogenic blends, on nootropics and pre-workout supplements, sleep aids, and all sorts of men's health products. And it's essentially a staple in these wellness stacks, which can be promoted as these safe daily things that you take to sort of optimize your functioning. But the way we use it today is actually very different from how it was used in Ayurvedic practices in the past. And for those of you who don't know, Ayurvedic medicine is essentially medicine that was developed in India 3,000 years ago. And when it was used back then, it was used short term or seasonally, and it was often tailored to the patient specifically and what was going on in their life. And that is in stark contrast to how it is used today, where it's taken every day for months, sometimes even years, it's taken at higher doses and often used without any professional oversight. And this shift from this cautious, individualized use to a chronic self-prescribed consumption has led to a lot of problems, I believe. On top of that, I wanna shatter the belief that just because something is natural means it is harmless. This is like the fallacy of the wellness label that is put on this or the fact that you can get it as a supplement without a prescription. People just automatically assume that it is safe. And people also think that if something is a herb, it's going to be gentle. But natural or something being a herb doesn't mean harmless. Just think about the harms that we can see caused by cannabis at high doses. And supplements like ashwagandha can act just like drugs, especially when they're taken at high doses or combined with other psychoactive substances. And so the idea that side effects only come from chemicals is both misleading, but it's also dangerous. And in fact, there are increasing numbers of people out there who are reporting unexpected and persistent side effects like emotional blunting, uh, withdrawal symptoms when they try and stop, and also persistent sexual dysfunction. And animal studies are showing drug-like effects on brain chemistry and hormone systems. And so despite the hype surrounding this drug, there is serious growing evidence that this ancient remedy may come with very real risks similar to pharmaceuticals like antidepressants. And so let's dive into the first part of this talk. I wanna talk about what ashwagandha does to the brain and body. This isn't just a calming herb because it acts on the same neurochemical pathways as psychiatric drugs. And here's how. Well, firstly, it has GABAergic activity. It is like a natural benzo. Ashwagandha enhances the activity of GABA-A receptors in the brain. And this was shown in a 2023 study by Dr. Park, who showed that ashwagandha extract increased GABA and increased GABA receptors in rats. Now, GABA is the brain's primary calming neurotransmitter. This is the same one targeted by things like Xanax and Valium and Ambien. And what happens when you hit these receptors is that you get those same drug-induced effects, things like sedation and reduced anxiety. And that's exactly what ashwagandha is doing. On top of that, it's also disrupting the endocrine system, which is essentially our system for hormones. Ashwagandha has been shown to reduce cortisol levels, and this is often marketed as a good thing, but long-term suppressing cortisol can cause problems like blunted motivation and energy. It can also weaken your immune system, and it may also interfere with all of your hormone systems, like things like your thyroid and also your testosterone levels. And these hormonal effects have led to increased rates of miscarriages. And these risks ultimately led to Denmark banning ashwagandha in their country in 2023. In addition to the endocrine effects, ashwagandha also has SSRI-like effects. So that is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor effects. 
it has been shown to increase serotonin levels in the brain. Now, a researcher named Dwayne in 2024 gave ashwagandha extract to rats, and it showed that it increased serotonin, probably by preventing the ability of the brain to break it down. He postulated some effects on monoamine oxidase activity. Now, that's the enzyme that breaks down these neurotransmitters. And so, in short, this drug pharmacologically can really act like a natural antidepressant but with none of the regulatory and prescriber oversight. Now, these aren't just homeopathic doses. When people take ashwagandha, they notice a real and prominent effect. That is why it is so popular. And so you need to stop thinking about ashwagandha as being something that is sort of balancing or supportive. I know it is wrapped up with all of this language where they say, you know, it's an adaptogen, which means it helps your body adapt to stress. I'm a super cynical psychiatrist. You know, I've heard all of the mumbo jumbo about things being a chemical imbalance and restoring, you know, your brain to a place of balance. And so when someone says, oh, it's an adaptogen, it just like helps you like figure out your stress as if it like goes in there and it's just like optimizing all of these pathways to just help you function better. I call bullshit on that because like show me the proof that it's doing that because everything that I've seen so far is that it just seems to be a kind of like a drug that has all these different drug effects that may be useful. I don't think it's like helping your body adapt. So, you know, as I've shown you in this section, it acts on the same brain chemicals as drugs that require prescriptions and boxed warnings and tapering protocols. And so if you're using ashwagandha daily, especially at high doses, you're not just like kind of supporting your stress system, you're chemically altering it like you would if you were taking a psychiatric drug. Now let's talk about some of the effects that this drug can have. And the first two I wanna talk about is emotional blunting and mood instability. Now for a supplement marketed to restore balance, many users feel like it's doing anything but that. And so the first thing is emotional blunting. While some users enjoy the reduction in anxiety, much like they would with an SSRI, Others feel like it can cause emotional detachment, and they describe feeling numb to joy and sadness, indifferent towards loved ones, feeling disconnected from their own thoughts and desires. And so this isn't just like feeling calm, it's kind of feeling cut off from your emotional self. And it is eerily similar to the flattening and mood constriction that people experience on serotonin antidepressants like Prozac or Zoloft. On top of that, sometimes when the effect is, 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 is large, it's a large effect for that person, people will describe things like depersonalization and derealization. This is like when they feel like they're watching their life from a distance. They can feel like they've lost their identity, they're disconnected from reality, and they're just like floating through daily life, not really sort of engaged and in there. And again, these effects mirror the dissociative symptoms that are often seen with psychiatric drug use. Now, I mentioned mood instability before, and ashwagandha, although it is experienced as calming by many people, much like the SSRIs, it can actually cause paradoxical effects in some people. Just like cannabis can make some people relax and other people paranoid, ashwagandha can be calming for some people and it can also cause mood instability in other people. They'll report feeling irritable or having sudden mood swings. And these side effects don't just happen when people get on the drug, they've also been reported to occur months or even years after use. Again, similar to the antidepressants, where sometimes it's that chronic ongoing use that eventually breaks the system and then you start to see those side effects later on. The next issue I wanna talk about is when ashwagandha can cause what seems to be like some chronic or permanent long-term damage to the nervous system. This has been called ashwagandha syndrome online. And there have been a flood of reports about people who are experiencing this and it has painted a picture of a very disturbing pattern of symptoms. And so if you go on places like Reddit or nootropic forums and supplement subreddits, they're filled with people who say ashwagandha mess them up. And many of them are describing long lasting, unexpected side effects that didn't go away after stopping this herb. Alarmingly, some of these symptoms are reported to have occurred after just one dose. Now here's what they're describing. And this really echoes what we're seeing with many other drug harms out there, whether it's post-SSRI sexual dysfunction, post-finasteride syndrome, or post-Accutane syndrome. Now, these folks who have been exposed to ashwagandha, they're reporting genital numbness and loss of sexual sensation, a complete loss of libido, anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure, emotional disconnection from loved ones, 
panic, derealization and intrusive fear, and finally a sense that their nervous system has been permanently changed by exposure to this drug. And one of the most frightening things when I read these reports is that when this happens to people, they go to their GP or their psychiatrist or their endocrinologist, and they're told that is essentially in their head. They do not recognize that ashwagandha, this seemingly safe herb, can cause problems like this. And so many people are left without recognition, treatment, or diagnosis. It's essentially like you've been blindsided. One day you were doing fine, and the next minute you have what feels like permanent neurological damage. You might not even realize that ashwagandha has been responsible for this. And most of your time, your doctor won't either. It's like the, the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. It's a terrible thing to happen. Now, this side effect also has some backing from animal studies. So back in 2002, a researcher and his colleagues studied male rats exposed to ashwagandha. And what they found was a significant drop in sexual behavior. Critically, they found that these effects persisted even after the rats stopped this extract that they were given and that the testosterone levels remained normal, meaning that this wasn't just about hormonal disruption. And this is essentially what we're seeing in humans who are now reporting experiencing this ashwagandha syndrome. Unfortunately, I think many people are gonna think that this is very rare, but as someone who studies rare side effects, Oftentimes they're a lot less rare than people think they are. They're often completely misdiagnosed. You know, there's no diagnostic codes in like medical databases. Uh, doctors haven't heard about it. So they're not being recorded and they're not being diagnosed. So it probably seems like it's something that's not very common. But I think when more people start to learn about this, there'll be many more people putting their hands up saying, yes, when I took ashwagandha long-term, this happened to me as well. Now, next I wanna talk about tolerance and withdrawal problems from ashwagandha. Now, many people think because this is a supplement and a herb, it's not supposed to be addictive, it's not supposed to cause tolerance, but for many people, stopping this thing can come at a cost. There are multiple users reporting online that quitting ashwagandha, especially after chronic use, can lead to rebound anxiety, severe insomnia, panic attacks, depersonalization, and a feeling like your brain has gone offline. A lot of this looks like psychiatric drug withdrawal. These symptoms mimic what is seen when people come off Xanax and Valium and different benzos. It mimics what's happening when people are coming off SSRIs and SNRIs. And this makes sense because as you saw earlier on in this video, it's causing changes in serotonin. It's causing changes in GABA receptors. And so ashwagandha really is just acting like a pharmaceutical uh, psychiatric drug, but without a prescription label. And we've even seen some case reports about this recently. You know, in 2025, there was a case report that was published about a 20 year old man who developed severe withdrawal after stopping high dose ashwagandha supplements. And the author claims that this was the first report of ashwagandha withdrawal in the medical literature. Uh, this person who came off was reporting insomnia, restlessness, panic episodes. And his doctors were completely un unaware that ashwagandha could cause withdrawal. Now, just because the fact that this is the first case report in the medical literature um, and it's now 2025, it just simply shows that this is not being recognized by people um, and that people are only just starting to catch on. And it really just shows how far behind doctors are in really recognizing that this is a problem. Now, the next thing that I think is also really important to understand about ashwagandha um, because it, you know, it's like an unregulated supplement, is that there is a lot of product variability between the different types that you take. And, and, and for some people, they might be taking more than they know they're taking, um, and that can cause problems. And so, and so not all ashwagandha is created equally. Sometimes the supplements will have root only versus root plus leaf, and then also how the um, pharmacologically active chemical is extracted, whether it's extracted in water or alcohol can change things. And this leads to differences in the active chemical with an olide that can range from you know 2.5% in some supplements to over 35% in others. And this is just depending on the extract. On top of that, some brands contain undisclosed or uncharacterized compounds that make up 90% of the pill. And so what this means is that two bottles with the same label can have dramatically different effects on people. This is not standardized like pills that you're getting of Zoloft or Prozac. It's you know, this is the Wild West people, you know, these are unregulated supplements. And on top of that, most of the clinical trials that have looked at ashwagandha and which are kind of um, reporting its health benefits 
um, they're short term. You know, they're just like the psychiatric drug studies. They are like four to eight weeks and they are conducted on healthy, uh, mildly anxious individuals who don't have any other problems. And they're showing that it's safe or it's showing that it's been effective for these people. But guys, people are using ashwagandha for months and sometimes even years uh, to sort of make blanket statements that this drug is safe and effective after four to eight weeks of use does not mean it's going to be safe and effective after you know five years or 10 years of use. There's a huge disconnect between um, the clinical studies and actually how it's being used now on a much more regular basis. So let's wrap up now and talk about why you haven't heard that this supposedly safe supplement is so risky for some people. Well, the supplement industry is essentially an empire that has no breaks. It's worth billions um, and it operates with minimal regulatory oversight. And unlike the pharmaceuticals, there's no requirements for pre-market clinical trials, long-term safety studies, or post-marketing surveillance. And also there's no regulation over how it is marketed. You know, ashwagandha can be aggressively promoted by wellness influencers, fitness coaches, supplement companies. And because of that, the voices of people who have had problems with this are essentially being drowned out by this tidal wave of advertising to kind of sell this supplement. And so that's it for me today. If you learned something new in this video and it was helpful, please consider liking it and sharing it with someone else. If you like what I do here on the channel, I'd love it if you'd subscribe. And if you've been harmed by ashwagandha, tell me about it in the comments below. I would love to hear about it. And if you wanna hear a story about someone who experienced this exact thing, you're not going to wanna miss my interview with Lucas right over here.